absolute pleasure to uh, have a session with Aurajit Sen. Um, he's, uh, he's considered actually to be the progenitor of the graphic novel in India. So, you know, he's the best person actually to talk about and talk with about uh, not just the graphic novel, but also graphic art per se in India. We're going to come to that towards the end of the session. Um, uh, so, so we are going to be talking about not just the graphic novel, but graphic novellas, short fiction, uh, graphic non-fiction, such as um, some of the work he's done as well. Um, and we'll come by towards the end of the session, we'll quickly actually also go through some of his later works, which many of you must be familiar with. Uh, he has a lot of followers and uh, he's... Uh, you know, he's there very much a presence on Instagram and, you know, all, all the social media, Facebook and all of that. And, and his political graphic work of late has been extraordinarily popular. Uh, so we will actually come to that. Um, and this actually is a session with images. Uh, we can't see the screen, so we don't know if it's... Uh, talking to you about my favorite subject, which is about comics, graphic novels and visual art. So now our images are set up. Uh, I just want to hear from you, uh, all of you, can you hear the, uh, uh, can you see? And can you see the images on the screen? Yeah, okay, great. So, Savita. Uh, so, you know, the graphic novel uh, as an art form, of course it goes back to the history of comics, etc. Uh, the term itself, graphic novel, is actually only coined in 1964 by Will Eisner um, and one of the greatest graphic novelists whom um, Aurijit will speak about as, uh, as as a text that actually prompted him to also attempt this form uh, is Art Spiegelman, right? I'm, those of you who know graphic novels of course know the phenomenal graphic novel called Mouse which is about the Holocaust and uh, it actually, you know, Spiegelman actually starts with his own story, the Spiegelman family story as exiles during the Holocaust. Um, and the Jews uh, were called rats by, by the Nazis, and which is why the title Maus, M-A-U-S in German, which actually translates not exactly to mouse, but to rats in, in, in English. Um, so uh, Maus is, you know, is, is the kind of text that made a huge impact and this was, in, in some sense, it was uh, the, the text that actually anchored uh, and anticipated everything that came afterwards in the graphic novel form. Uh, Spiegelman publishes Mouse uh, between 1980 and 1991. It's serialized, actually, so it runs for 11 years uh, as in, in panel form. Um, and, and Spiegelman actually says about the graphic novel that uh, it's, it's a comic... Uh, a graphic novel is a comic book long enough to need a bookmark. <laughs> so uh, that, that's a slightly comic kind of um, uh, description of what a graphic novel is. But also it acknowledges very much that it originates from the comic. Comic book is actually graphic novel. So you have, uh, you know, we, we need to look at actually the, the relationship between the comic and the graphic novel, which is kind of a slightly, um, uh, a slightly undetermined territory, really, in terms of you know where does a comic end, where does a graphic novel or a graphic work of fiction begin? That's that's a question that I will pose to Aurijit. Uh, I don't think uh, anybody will have very clear answers to that. Uh, but uh, you know, th this particular definition of the graphic novel as a long comic book, an adult's comic book, which needs a bookmark to read, um, that gets update, that keeps getting updated, that definition actually keeps getting updated and uh, 2006, uh, Eddie Campbell actually writes a manifesto uh, for the graphic novel where he extends that definition quite a bit further and, and brings in all sorts of other graphic narrative possibilities into the graphic novel. So, so it, it doesn't have to be fiction, for example, he says, it could be non-fiction, it could be a documentary essay in visual form. It could be graphic art, which, you know, panels which have a connection with each other, not necessarily a single narrative. 
So, so, so the, the definition of the graphic novel itself actually keeps getting more and more updated. Um, yeah, these are some images uh, that you see from, from uh, Spiegelman's mouse. Uh, and you see, of course, the, 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 the crowd, the, the, the Jews as a crowd, as a polity, um, represented as, as rats. Uh, Orijit, you want to say something about Spiegelman? Uh, yeah, oh, I, I think Sabita and I agreed that we should start with Spiegelman, although the, uh, the, the, uh, our focus is really graphic novels in India and what has happened in the past 20 odd years that the medium has uh, proliferated here. Uh, but Mouse is an appropriate starting point. Um, what's interesting here is uh, that he used a very, uh, um, uh, a very specific kind of a comics language where animals uh, speak uh, and animals stand in for humans. This is something uh, that is very uh, unique about comics in the sense that we all know, of course, from Mickey Mouse, the history of animals and speaking animals and how they stand in for human emotions and feelings. And uh, I have to say that uh, I, I've been drawing comics from when I was a little kid in school. Uh, I was obsessed with comics. Uh, me, uh, my friends and I were all obsessed because back then there was no television and of course there was no internet. So comics were the only form of visual literature that we grew up with and it was natural for some of us to want to draw them and to make our own stories and we used to do that. Um, but as I grew older, as we all grew older, uh, we were expected to move on to more serious kinds of literature and comics were really looked down upon and frowned upon by the parents and teachers. And in my case, I did move on to reading more serious literature, but I didn't lose my fascination for comics. And I continued to read comics and make comics. And uh, then I went to design school uh, at NID in Ahmedabad, and uh, I continued to make comics. My teachers said, you know, you really need to get over this. I mean, uh, this is kind of a distraction from the serious work that you're supposed to be doing. But I kept drawing comics. and. And then in 1984, when I was in college, uh, the first volume of Mouse was published, and uh, it won the Pulitzer Prize, and it featured on the cover of Time magazine. That Time magazine landed in our NID library, and I was so excited to, when I saw, I felt vindicated that yes, I've been doing the right thing. And uh, I took out that library, that uh, that magazine from the library, and I went and waved it in my teachers' faces and said, "See, this is what I'm talking about." Mm, and they had to admit that or maybe they didn't know stuff. So yeah, that, so yeah, for me personally, Mouse holds an important moment in my life and work as a graphic novelist. Um, this actually is the first, is acknowledged to be the first published graphic novel in India, Orijit's River of Stories. This is actually the new edition of the book. It was uh, published first in 1994. Um, Orijit actually started drawing, doing the sketches and preparatory work for this from 91 onwards. So, um, uh, what, wh why, why, you know, we also showed you these particular images from Mouse is also that, uh, uh, you know, there, there, is, there, is, there is a way of drawing a crowd, a polity, right? And what, what, do, what, what does it mean to actually draw people, draw, especially draw people who are affected by something? Uh, draw people. draw people whose lives are, who, who are dispossessed and whose lives are displaced by, uh, by political circumstances. Uh, now, River of Stories, Sorajit Sen's first graphic novel, um, is, uh, is based on, I mean, it's the occasion for this text is the Narmada Bachao Andolan, right, against, against the building of the Sardar Sarovar Dam. Uh, and the, the context, of course, is the displacement of, uh, of the Adivasis, of the tribes who are living by the Narmada Valley. Um, and, uh, and Orijit actually does something very interesting. I mean, it's, it's in some sense, it's documentary, uh, it's a documented narrative, but in another, in another sense, uh, it's also fictionalized. So, so you do have certain characters, including actually mythical characters. Um, so in some sense, for me, I mean, I was very excited when I first saw this. This is 1994, and I'm, I'm like in undergrad college, and I remember seeing the first edition of this, brought out by Kalpa Vriksha, 
uh, and you know suddenly these exciting possibilities of the medium actually became quite apparent and also its relationship to the comic uh, to the comic book i mean all of us have grown up on asterix and tintin and uh, you know and we had uh, and and of course watching disney cartoons on tv and all of that so so it, so so it was very exciting actually and and i had already read mouse uh, when this came out it was it was it marked a particular moment in 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 a shifting sort of visual language uh, where it suddenly looked as if it's possible now to uh, not only do art with uh, the graphic form and which mixes docu the documentary with the mythological with a personal fictionalization uh, not uh, that it's not only possible to do that but it's also possible to protest it's also possible to mobilize this medium uh, as a as a mode of uh, protest and documenting actually a people's struggle um, so uh, you know the, the the story actually starts with uh, uh, relku Re relku is actually a central character here she's she's somebody who's been displaced from the narmada valley but we don't know that in the first few panels we know that she's working as a domestic help in an urban home in in bombay and um, um, and so so the person whom she's working for vishnu asks her to tell him her story and that's actually how the story starts unraveling and along with this uh, orijit actually weaves in uh, certain a certain mythology uh, mythology of um, the bhilala tribe uh, of the narmada valley and and the creation the creation myth actually the origin myth of the bhilala tribe uh, so you have you know so so one mythical character almost mythical character who is kind of the sustaining hero even though he's not there in every panel he's not part of every story in the book but he's the person who centrally holds the narrative together um gayan so so you have uh, you know you, you you have relku story you have uh, gayan story uh, and you have the mythology the origin myth weaving through it all and of course you very much have the documentation of the adivasis uh, being displaced them being taken over by you know the various mafias uh, construction mafia the the dam all of the government officials the their their home their forest becoming actually a reserve forest and suddenly belonging to the government and all of that that the entire story is actually kind of told through these modes however right um, so uh, origit you know can can you tell us a bit about the work that you did in a preparatory work actually that you did for river of stories uh so when so like i said ever since i was inspired by art speaker man i wanted to make my own graphic novel but uh, since i've been drawing from when i was a kid i tried many stories which never came to a completion it it's just so much work and uh, so much thought goes into one that i would start on a project and i would give up after five or six pages or whatever and then after some time start another project another project so i knew that uh, to do a long book is like a intense commitment and it has to be a story that you feel very deeply for mm, i mean if it's a story that doesn't move you to the core uh, you're unlikely to have the stamina to finish it and uh, so i was ever since mouse i had it in my mind that i want to do a graphic novel but i didn't know what about and uh, when i got out of nid i was uh, i'd set up this small uh, store for designers and crafts people uh, called people tree along with my wife and uh, we used to often have uh, activists from the narmada andolan and other uh, other protest movements coming to people tree because the designated protest space jantar mantar was very close to people tree so people would come and it became like an adda and we came to know more about the narmada andolan from people and who were coming in and we used to sell some of their pamphlets and all that and so then we decided i somehow felt attracted i said i need to go to the valley i need to go and understand this uh, what's going on there better and i and i did and i, I joined the narmada andolan as a as a kind of a Uh, from the uh, kalpavriksha is this sort of ngo based in delhi and we were like this uh, support group for the narmada andolan in in delhi and i i was i became part of kalpavriksha and then i became i went to the narmada valley and 
when I was uh, traveling around in the Narmada Valley meeting people, and at that time Baba Amte uh, had set up his ashram on the banks of the river Narmada, uh, and he had he had vowed that he would not move from there. And if the dam eventually came up, he would drown in the water, but he would not move. And uh, so I went and spent time at his ashram, and and the thought started brewing in my head that I want this is the story I want to tell. This is really the story that that moves me, and that I'm going to be able to commit myself to. And so that's really how uh, it all started. And I looked at the various different threads, like Sabita's pointed out. I discovered the creation myth of the Bilala people, and I realized that their entire creation myth is based on the river. Uh, the origin story is that they are, the, their story is about the creation of the river. Uh, for them, that is a central uh, sort of uh, divinity at the center of their mythology. And it struck me then that uh, it's such a different way of looking at uh, nature, at life, and our relationship with nature, where you, be you believe that you are the children of that, uh, divinity. You are, uh, that the divinity is your uh, your mother, your protector, your giver. And uh, we look at the river as planners, as architects, as designers. We look at these uh, natural elements as resources. Oh, oh, this river is just flowing by here and if we were to dam it over here, we can generate electricity from it. Oh, those forests, you know, they have, uh, we can plant more of these, uh, you know, trees that are more uh, uh, more financially lucrative instead of just having jungly trees. So clear the jungly trees, put teak or whatever it might be. So I think that exploitative view is so natural to our urban way of life. Uh, we look at nature and think of how best we can make a benefit from it, while for the Adivasis it's just the other way around. Uh, they're always like, how can we live as much closely and in harmony with nature as possible. And and so that's really those themes that kind of got me inspired to do this book. Um, Orijit, uh, what you also do here is to, is to mobilize uh, different kinds of visual languages to tell the story, right? I mean, you, for example, I mean, there's a lot of visual, in, I mean, I do, not, I do not want to say intertextuality, but, but, but there are references to other, other modes of uh, visual engagement. Um, and and Orijit, actually, the, the image that you see right now, it mobilizes, for example, art by the Warli tribe, right? Yeah. And, and also the Saora tribe. So so there are, you know, there are certain visual languages that are mobilized in telling the story, uh, part of which is, you know, the, uh, part of it is the, the, the realist line drawing with perspective, etc., of of the comic book. Uh, but also, you, you get, you know, you, you have a lot of panels where there's a sense of movement, almost like cinematic panels. And of course, you have the Worli and the uh, Sawara tribe, um, uh, tribal art forms here. Uh, and, uh, Orijit, you also mobilize uh, maps. Uh, can you tell us a bit about maps? Uh, for me, it's very important. In, this was my first book, but uh, in all my work since then, uh, I have been very deeply concerned with the idea of place and geography. Uh, also, uh, also, I know that your father was a cartographer. So, yeah. so is, is there is there also some, you know, some something very specific that you're also bringing in autobiographically through yeah, a kind of map yeah. making? I mean, uh, that was never a conscious thing. But when I look back at how uh, central mapping and maps have been to all my work, I realize that that's probably coming to me because uh, spending time with my father and. Uh, we used to go sometimes, when he used to go on mapping expeditions, literally he was going places where there were no roads, there were no, and the, his maps, or his, him, or not only him, but his, his team, uh, the maps they created were, would then become the, uh, you know, the, the base, the foundation on which other planners would then come in and maybe even build dams for that matter, you know, <laughs> the map making was, but to me, the map making, you know, walking but you, you, you also create your own map here, right? And yeah. just as, just as the, uh, in, in some sense, just as the forest community has a map of their own of the forest and, yeah. and, the, yeah. and the river exactly. as well, actually, exactly. right? So, yeah. Exactly. So, which is why I think to me, the uh, idea of maps always contains stories because I, I would walk with him in the forest and watch him at work and I would cross a stream and then later while he's 
working on the calculations, I can start to see in the map the, the stream that we crossed, the forest that we passed by, the hillock that we climbed. And so to me, they became invested with stories. And so in a way, I've always seen uh, maps as carriers of uh, narratives, of landscape, of people, of geographies. And I guess that has been very much a part of the way yeah, I Yeah, because go. I mean, you know, as much as this is a story of the people, it's also a story of a place. Yeah. yeah. Uh, not a place, but multiple places yeah. perhaps actually. So, yeah. you know, I mean, that there, is, there, is, there is a sort of mobilization of, uh, you know, other, other places, other landscapes, uh, what, what one would call actually heterotopias, right? I mean, these places that have been lost, that are being recovered through storytelling in some sense. Um, yeah. Uh, and and what I also find is that you know apart from um, apart from just mobilizing the visual uh, in in Orijit's work actually which is actually probably common to some comic art in general but uh, you you can almost hear the sounds right I mean the, these panels to me are actually so cinematic and so uh, multi sensorial um, you know I mean there's there's the sound of the you know the the the, the jeeps and the motor vehicles that are coming to build the dam, the jeeps of the officials, there is, there is the thud, there is the crack of the tree in the forest. You know, there's, there, it's mm. full of sound actually, which is, which is phenomenal. I mean, you know, to, to, to bring the sense of sound uh, in a visual work, uh, where you can literally, you, you actually hear these sounds while you're, while you're looking at it, while you're looking at the text. So can, can you tell us something a bit about then maybe the comic, the comic art form and you know how you how you draw certain elements from it. Yeah, uh, yeah. So these uh, what we call onomatopoeic sounds uh, are uh, are also part of the comics language, uh, and I have always been fascinated by them because it's great fun to imagine what something sounds like in your head, and then to create a language that describes that sound. Uh, I mean, these are, you, you, as the artist, you're free to invent it. Uh, like when the door, in, in this particular flame, when the door is being flung open, uh, uh, a bamboo door flung open and it strikes maybe the wall or something. And I imagine it makes a sound like tack. And then I think, how do I spell that sound? And I write out that sound. And I know that the reader, each reader will read that sound and imagine perhaps their own sound, a you know, different sound. So uh, to me, it's a really nice play and it's a kind of interactive thing in comics where you, you sort of ask your reader to imagine things. And so I think sound is a, is a great element in comics and the fact that you don't actually have sound as in cinema, but you have these sound, uh, things that provoke sound in the head. Uh, you also have, of course, the panorama, right? I mean, you have, um, sorry. Uh, there, there is also the panorama, you know, which, which, which goes back to actually that point about map making. Yeah. You know, I mean, I feel that Orjit is actually kind of drawing also a, a different map of the region through this book. So, uh, so, so, it, so if you're talking about the cinematic trope, uh, if you're talking about the cinematic trope in the book, uh, uh, then, then there's also, you know, the, the camera sort of pans out, shows you the landscape from the top, there's an eagle's eye view. Uh, sometimes it zooms in, you see objects very, you know, in, in close-up. Uh, you see people's facial features in close-up, the lines on the faces, the, 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 the grimace of the mouth, uh, especially of the government officials. You know, you can, you can actually evoke uh, not just affect, uh, but, uh, but I think you also evoke, uh, uh, you know, uh, the sense of, uh, not, not just a sense of good and evil, uh, but but a, a sense of character, you know, uh, uh, which is which goes beyond actually just the usual comic form thing of the good and the evil. So so there there is a there is an evocation of the mythological uh, through those uh, uh, certain facial features and a certain way in which you put uh, sorry faces together. Where is the where do we have the image of? Oh, that's in the other PDF. Yeah. Okay. We'll yeah we'll come back to actually a bit of this later. Um, but uh, you know, so there are there are ways in which uh, ways in which many faces could be put together as one face. For example, I mean, Orijit does that too, uh, and, and 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 like alternative human faces. I mean, they're not exactly human, and they're not exactly divine. They're not exactly the Amar Chitra Katha kind of gods and goddesses kind of faces. But 
but there's 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 an element of all this in in quite a few of the panels um uh, now i i want to talk uh, i want you to tell us uh, orjit just you know this is the last bit right now about the river of stories uh, but can you can can you just tell us a bit about how you went about characterization in this um so as i was saying i i like to research my stories very deeply uh, i spent many months traveling to and fro between the narmada valley and delhi where i was based at that time and my studio and uh, uh, i was sketching all the time and the act of sketching live on wherever you are in the in the presence of the space that you're in this is very important for me as part of the process of internalizing uh, a space i mean the people the landscapes the features the mm, everyday objects uh, and uh, uh, i was talking to you yesterday about this outsider's gaze uh, i'm always when i travel i'm always an outsider but because as an outsider you're having an encounter with a space and a people you're curious about a lot of things and to me this is interesting because uh, as long as of course your gaze is empathetic uh, and you are open and you know you try and shed as much of your biases as you possibly can uh, you are uh, you capture a lot of things which uh, people who are uh, you know very familiar or off that place um, may take for granted or may not think about I mean they may not be aware of it uh, but i notice things uh, not i but any outsider would notice things that the local person would maybe just not think about Uh, and i think that itself the process of sketching is a way of uh, going into things and interestingly as i would sketch my sketchbooks became more and more full of my drawings and sketches local people would get interested in what i'm doing obviously like okay well, in fact one time i remember at a fair and people were dancing and drinking and it was like a big party happening and i was sitting in the corner and sketching some people were really curious like why aren't you like dancing and having fun out while you sitting in this corner with a paper and pencil so i could hear them discussing amongst each other like what is this guy doing and finally one man who was the uh, more you know more knowledgeable than the others and also more drunk i think he thought about it and he said oh uh, like he must be drunk uh, too drunk to dance so he scribbling on that piece of paper so anyway so what i'm saying is that it's it's also a way of uh, sketching unlike say photographing which is another way of documenting and i do that also of course but uh, a photograph distances you from what you take the moment you take a photograph uh, your attention is gone from that and then you're looking at the next thing to take a photograph of but when you're drawing you're looking deeply at one thing and you're making yourself still and uh, you're capturing that which is essential you're not going to draw every little shoelace or every detail of the thing but you're going to capture the essence you're going to pare it down to what is really important so that uh, that way of sketching really you know it becomes like a part of your own vocabulary of expression so uh, to me that is really how i research my stories and how i feel enter into that space uh orjit actually goes on uh then to uh, form actually possibly the first collective of graphic artists in in india the pao collective right so so there is um and 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 some of these uh, come out as you know some some of these novellas come together in an anthology called the pao anthology um so now where does the graphic novel go after 1994 for for about 10 years there's like hardly anything and then in 2004 exactly 10 years later is sardar banerjee's uh, corridor um now corridor actually is is a, is a very different text from from river of stories i mean corridor is entirely urban it's set actually it's so uh, it's so urban that it's actually set in the heart of delhi in connaught place there are three characters who are uh, you know who are just hangers on they just friends hanging out in connaught place uh, you know they they go to the they go to old booksellers they they kind of the down and out or the you know the slightly disaffected youth um in delhi uh the central character is someone called bhrigu so it's it's basically it's a very urban text what i'm trying to say here is that corridor actually in some sense 
follows more the, the Western graphic novel tradition of, 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 of things being actually set in more urban sort of uh, set, not just settings, but it's in its sensibility as well, actually, it's, it's, it's very urban. It does not quite acknowledge an Indian um, sort of art tradition, uh, but, but, a, but, a, but a rather cosmopolitan urban one. Uh, and what Orijit actually just spoke about, right? I mean, the uh, photographs. Yeah. The photographs uh, as icons, I mean, that's actually something that, that Sarnath also actually, Sarnath mobilizes that. So you have a certain panel here, which, uh, do we have the panel with Stalin and? Yeah, here's it. Yeah, I can't see actually. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, I, I, I'd be interested to listen to Orijit actually tell us a bit about Sarnath's work and how he discovers Sarnath's work and their long association. Yeah, when I was drawing River of Stories in the back room of People Tree, which was which, had, which was my studio, uh, Sarnath was among uh, some young people who used to come now and then to have chai or chat or whatever, and he grew fascinated by the work I was doing, uh, and he was, then he started coming quite regularly to see how much progress I'd made and to ask questions, and he said, "Hey, I also want to make comics and graphic novels." Uh, so I encouraged him, of course, I said, yes, I mean, we need more people to make comics. And uh, so he did. He started off, he was really serious about it, and he started off uh, with his own ideas. He was working with the film and TV company at that time, so he already had a lot of good thoughts in terms of what kind of stories to tell. Or, uh, and he had this trademark sense of humor and irony and all of that. Uh, and I think with the comics, he became he found a, a sort of medium that where he could bring all of this in uh, in, a, in a very direct way. And uh, so that's how he started working on Corridor after a while. And then he was obviously, uh, he was a better uh, person to reach out with comics than me. Uh, uh, I was just doing my own thing and being in my corner in my world. He went out to the publishers and said, okay, let's, you know, I'm doing this comic and he convinced Penguin that graphic novels are the thing and we should publish it and and then his first graphic novel got published by a mainstream commercial publisher. So that's a turning point in Indian graphic novels. Yeah, and then Sarnath, pretty quickly is enough, he comes out with the second book, Barn Owls, The Barn Owls Wanderers Capers, which is actually set in, uh, well, which is set in Calcutta. It also tells the story of Calcutta as a, as a city, as a colonial city, all of that. Um, and then we, uh, we, we both thought that it will be nice to also look at, oh, oh yeah, in Sadhna's work, do you see in this particular, in these particular panels, uh, you know, the, the iconic uh, photographs of, or, mm, you know, mm. yeah, images of mm. Lenin, so, Mao, yeah. <laughs> so he brought in this Stalin, idea of, che. you know, collaging photographs onto the drawing and uh, uh, bringing in sort of, uh, another layer of uh, referentiality into his work. That's true, and, and, al and also political in a different way. I mean, you know, your, yeah. your, your text is political in, in, in a very immediate sort of way, mm. in, in an almost visceral sort of way. Yeah. Whereas in, in Sadlat's work, for example, you know, the, or, or Vishajyotis, which we will look at right now, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the political thing actually is more historical. It's, you know, it's more, it's more actually stories of something that happened pretty much, I mean, not, not way back in the past, but something that can be established quite easily as, as the past. Um, uh, so Vishwajyoti, Vishwajyoti Ghosh, uh, uh, another, you know, uh, he's crucial to the story of the graphic novel in India. Uh, Delhi Kam, so I'll, I'm going to let Aurijit tell us a bit about Delhi Kam. Uh, Vishwa was also one young art student who used to come in to people tree when I was working on graphic novels and he got excited by the whole thing. And um, so he too started working slowly on shorter comics and everything. And then eventually uh, he had this big idea which he wanted to work on. And he had grown up uh, in Delhi uh, through, and he had obviously been quite impacted uh, by his uncles and others during the emergency, facing the difficulties of the emergency and uh, uh, this oppression that was being unleashed. So he started, wanting to write a story set in Delhi during the time of the emergency. And that good Delhi Kam is what resulted from that. Uh, it is really a kind of a, his, 
it's both a history telling but it's also sort of a very personal memoir kind of, of take on what he uh, as a child experienced uh, of the emergency but then looking back at it as a historical thing. Yeah, so 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 Delhi Kaam, you know, De Delhi Kaam is very much actually, you know, it's 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 like directly political in that sense. It is looking at the emergency, um, spe specifically the emergency years, seventy-five to seventy-seven, and uh, you know, Shujoti too. Uh, you know, th there are these uh, intertextual uh, sort of references in Vishujyoti. You have, you do have, uh, for example, you do have images of newspaper covers, right? I mean, very many newspapers. Uh, if those of us who, I mean, we, some of us may not remember personally, but but we know from photographs we've seen later, from what we've read, that uh, some some newspapers marked protests, like like the Indian Express, marked the protest against the emergency by not having a front page, by not carrying an editorial, just having the just having the newspaper masked, uh, and and no no news basically. There is no news in the newspaper, right? So, uh, so Vishu Jyoti actually mobilizes those kind of things. For example, you know, he he does have a have a uh, panel in which he shows you the newspaper, which is not a newspaper, which carries no news, hmm. because news has been silenced in the emergency. There is no news in the emergency. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so he's able to do you know those sorts of things to bring in actually the sense of fear and silence, you know, another kind of affect through the drawing. And and of course, you see the masked people. You see, I mean. Uh, it also reminds me of the Modi masks, which came later. But you know, the, the Indira, uh, the Indira cult was as much actually a cult as as the Modi cult in some sense. Uh, these masked people who become the the authoritarian leader, um, and uh, uh, so it's uh, the graphic novel is by the way not uh, it's, it's not just done by men in India, lest we think it's mostly men. Uh, a very important graphic artist in India is uh, Amrita Patil. Her Kari uh, was was an absolute breakthrough text in in some sense. It was uh, it again brought back another kind of visual language. Don't yeah. Agree, yeah. Uh, uh, a more a more indigenous one. I mean, she's she's she's, uh, she's not unafraid to experiment with mm. very stylized kind of mm. drawing and. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Amrita, I think does a. Uh, very interesting thing with Kari because uh, uh, she's well for one thing she is the first woman graphic novelist to get published uh, uh, and uh, I think her uh, she's she dwells upon it's a uh, unlike let's say um, the others we've talked about till now her book dwells on a very, uh, it's much more interior. There's kind of interiority to her work and her concerns, especially in Kari. And uh, it is very much about uh, uh, a woman's, a modern Indian woman grappling with the issues of modernity. Uh, and uh, uh, it's very be beautifully drawn and she's kind of, she references a lot of art history, uh, art historical imagery uh, uh, through her work. Uh, for example, uh, here you see the this sequence comes during the course of a party that, so uh, it's based a little bit around, I know also happen to know Amrita from when she was quite young because she's from Goa and we were living in Goa at that time and we uh, met Amrita through some common friends. She hadn't yet started on comics but she was doing a lot of small pieces and she showed me her initial character Kari and that she wanted to develop something with that and then she did and but then what happened is that she went and worked in an ad agency in Bombay for uh, a couple of years but maybe less uh, and this book is really an uh, amal sort of an amalgam of her experiences moving out of small town Goa into a big city like Bombay being thrown into this ad glamorous advertising world and uh, kind of dealing with that so there is a very interesting uh, uh, sort of a uh, I mean, it's a kind of feminism, not in the, uh, not in the overtly uh, sloganeering kind of a way, but a sort of a deep dwelling into what it means for a woman to negotiate uh, life in a modern metropolis like Bombay. Uh, yeah, she uh, well, she also you know she, uh, her 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 work is uh, very very referential and very very intertextual actually. I mean, you see that this particular that's what you started looking at. This particular panel, you can see it's you know it's the Last Supper, 
um, being uh, clearly kind of mimicked actually in a, for, for, a, for an urban party. And what is interesting here is that she, the sequence yeah. before this, it flows from a party that she attends in somebody's yeah. house and then suddenly when you turn the page, uh, that party has rearranged itself into like a last supper kind of a um, frame. Again, I mean, this one is a, a famous painting by Frida Kahlo and she kind of places herself within her, herself and her friend within this sort of uh, Frida-like image. Uh, uh, so, so, you know, so, so there, there's uh, what, what, as Arjit said, what, what, in some sense, actually what Amrita does is to, is, is to bring actually some, something that was perhaps a little missing in, in earlier texts, which is, which is a real, uh, which is a, uh, very essential sense of interiority, you know, to look at what's going on inside rather than the landscape outside, la rather than the either the political landscape or you know the the spatial landscape outside. So, so she brings actually another kind of topos, an interior. She brings another kind of interior topos to uh, the graphic novel, uh, and now we move on to actually she, you know, we, this will be more or less the last. Uh, before we look at uh, Bhimayana. Um, uh, Parispita Singh, another artist who was part of the Pau Collective. Um, and uh, her, her novel, The Hotel at the End of the World, uh, you know, the, each of these actually marks a certain shift, in fact, in the language. Uh, each, of them, each of them is actually coming at the graphic novel from different kinds of, different ends in terms of, in terms of, you know, the artistic language, in terms of, uh, the context in which they're working, in the context that they want to uh, foreground in their work. So, uh, so there are, you know, while we are telling the story of the graphic novel as one story, it's not, it's not a monolithic story. It's, uh, it is multiple people making very different kinds of work. So uh, we just wanted to give you a sense of, and, and hopefully you guys will look it up, right? I mean, those who are not familiar with these works, uh, uh, You'll be curious enough to go and check out Kari, check out Parismita's work, check out Delhi Kam, uh, check out, of course, River of Stories. So um, uh, we just wanted to give you a kind of idea of the world of the graphic novel as it exists so far. Now, another crucial break, actually, uh, before. So here I, yeah, th this is another text by, uh, yeah, Munu. So, so you have, uh, you know, you have people finding this as a medium to tell stories. Right, so uh, if you if you have uh, if you had um, Amrita also trying to tell the story of a lesbian woman, uh, you know, so, so, so stories that are otherwise difficult to tell can be told through this medium through a certain possibility of distancing oneself from uh, from the subject at hand. Um, so uh, this text by Sajid is uh, you know the, the it's, it's 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 a text produced by a Kashmiri person and. Clearly, of course, a political story told about a place that we don't really get to hear, we, we get to hear too much about on the one hand, but we don't really get to hear about on the other. Um, would you like to say something about this? Uh, I think uh, Malik Sajad uses also, I suppose, like me, inspired by, he was inspired by Mao's, because he uses this uh, uh, trope of this, uh, of the Hangul stag. Uh, or the uh, deer, Hangul deer from uh, uh, from Kashmir. Uh, so all the Kashmiris in his story are represented with the kind of deer heads, uh, and uh, and it's just, it's really a, a coming of age story. It's about his own life, in, uh, and it's called uh, Munnu, a boy from Kashmir, and uh, it weaves in very naturally, obviously, and effortlessly uh, the what growing up as uh, in a war-torn and uh, violently sort of uh, suppressed society is like for kids. Uh, uh, and how, how it's very interesting in his book how all the, ch the childhood things that we would all be talking about, we did this as kids, we used to do that, we used to want this, so want that, is all sort of mediated by violence or by this threat of violence or this impending violence that uh, sort of surrounds him. It's a very powerful storytelling. This is just an example. We worry about uh, exams and studies and blah, blah, and 
and here he is using the possibility of violence and the Indian Army's presence as an excuse to skip the exam or to not do the exam or not study. And his father telling him, uh, as you can read from the text. So, uh, the, the, I mean, this is exactly to me, uh, it's a strong story because of the way he tells it. Um. This, uh, many of you might, uh, hopefully are familiar with this, Bhimayana. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually, uh, it, it's, it's, um, it stands out in that uh, it's uh, Gond artist Durgabai Vyam and Subhash Vyam who have done the art for this work, right? I mean, this is, this is the story of Bhimrao uh, Ambedkar, uh, told by Gond artists in an absolutely brilliantly done I mean, in fact, you know, it's for me, actually, this is astoundingly brilliant uh, graphic work, uh, very stylized in the Gond style, but also very, very contemporary. Uh, so Durga Bhai Vyam and Subhash Vyam, uh, you know, uh, are able to actually tell the story of Ambedkar through, even if you actually don't have text, you know, it's, it's such powerful visual text, this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, the text, of course, is done by, uh, by S. Anand. Um, and um, you know, th I mean, this is this is another text that everybody should actually look up. Also, because it's uh, you know, I mean, here here are the Gond artists telling the story of Ambedkar through actually very stylized and very contemporary and very modern uh, uh, Gond art. I mean, th there is no there is no sense of you know this as having been an art form which is no longer in use or something. You can see how how absolutely alive and how vital. Vital is the word to use. How vital the the art form is, um, and how what what a thriving art form is, and and how 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 it is you know how how I mean how different is it actually when for example when you use the Warli or Saura kind yeah. of tribal art and when yeah. when Durga Bai and Subhash Vyam yeah. do this how it's how, totally how different this, yeah. yeah and I think that uh, the way they have sort of uh, Cross the barrier. Uh, I mean, they've, they, they, they've put away this idea of frame by frame narration. Uh, they've put away the idea of uh, uh, of realism in terms of the depicted realism of the situation or things. They have embraced their sort of symbolic use of symbols to represent emotions, feelings, uh, and. So in that sense, it is, uh, it's a very different, I mean, I don't think anything like this has been done. Yeah, you also see before. actually here, even the speech bubble, yeah. the speech bubble of the, of the, uh, you know, the, the slightly more evil characters are actually like scorpions. Yeah. And the speech bubbles of the positive characters in the text are like, like a bird. Yeah. You know, so, so there are, there are these subtle kind of things that, that, that they do, even with something as basic as the speech bubble in, in a cartoon. Um, I'm, I'm going to take us back um, now. We're going to end, wind up the session now, and then open up for discussion. Uh, but I want you to actually look at Orijit's new work, which is not not graphic novel, but very crucial. I mean, uh, Orijit will tell us a bit about the political graphic work. And uh, this is a new book, People of the Indus. Uh, we don't have time to go into it, but it's a very beautifully done. It's a collaboration by between an Indian artist, Nikhil Galati, and uh, uh, Jonathan Kenoyer, who is a very well-known international uh, specialist on the Indus Valley. Mm, and uh, it's beautifully done, drawn, uh, with very minimal uh, depictions, because we don't know too much about the visual reality of that civilization. Uh, but very convincing and interestingly done story. And, uh, okay. All right. uh, so no, I just I just want to say like one yeah, one please. word before you start the series. So you know that Orijit has been you know since since Modi's rise in particular actually since 2012 2014 and then of course all the more after 2019, uh, Orijit has been very much in the uh, you know very much in in the forefront of 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 artistic possibilities of protest, right? I mean how as as an artist how do you respond to this moment? So as a as a visual, as a graphic artist, how do you respond to this moment? And he has quite a few uh, stunning works, actually, which are, which, which fall somewhere between uh, you know, graphic art and collage and uh, comic and 
uh, and poster art, right? So, so it, it kind of, uh, you know, combines these genres and extends the possibilities of the graphic into a new kind of protest, a new kind of, a new possibility of protest. We'll, uh, we'll quickly get Orji to speak a bit about that and then open up to questions. Uh, so I started to do these works, uh, as she said, around 2012, uh, when I became more active on social media, and I found a kind of new medium through which uh, to express uh, uh, dissent and politics and things that I've addressed in, in other forms through other works. And uh, it was really quite uh, interesting to be able to put out things and get reach a wide audience and also get immediate uh, response or immediate kind of a, in my case, sometimes pushback from people. Uh, it really stimulated me to, to create uh, new work. It was almost like discovering a new form of communication or a new form of using art to uh, connect with uh, audiences and, uh, and to be able to hear back from them immediately. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, really kind of provoked me and a lot of this work comes out of just my engagement with social media. I see social media as uh, as a, a very a kind of ongoing and important aspect of my uh, my work um, and uh, uh, of course uh, our Prime Minister has been the target of a lot of my jokes but the jokes are not just for me, they're, they're jokes. I mean, in a sense, they are intended to make you laugh, but at the same time, they're intended to make you think. And uh, uh, and for me, personally, it's a it's a, a way of, otherwise I would get so frustrated and so angry with what's going on that it would kind of paralyze me. I mean, I needed to do things by using my art to come up with a creative response to what is going on so that I sort of distill anger into a kind of humor. All of this comes from a place of anger or a, a, a place of real sort of wanting. So, uh, and I think it really caught on on social media also because it probably captured the feelings of a lot of people. Uh, and thank you so much, Aurijit. We Unfortunately, we don't have time to, but this, do check out, okay. check him out on Instagram. I don't know if you can see the titles on this book, but this is a literary festival. So I thought I'd end <laughs> with this. Uh, these are what I consider to be Modi's reading list. <laughs> <laughs> das Chrony Capital and, you know, me, Mein Ki Baat, which is like Mein Kampf, of course, etc. So, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, you know, the kind of protest that's possible through graphic art. Uh, but we have to, unfortunately, wind up here. But we do have time to take a couple of quick questions. So the kind of questions which uh, I need to ask was that uh, regarding the themes uh, which have been employed in graphic novels. So uh, the early question was, uh, like, uh, has been any moment of uh, portraying the historically marginalized communities in uh, uh, you know, graphic novels, but uh, seeing Bhimayana, the Messiah himself has been, you know, portrayed. So I'm very happy. So uh, regarding the recent trends um, in graphic novels, uh, what are your comments on that? Mm, I, I think uh, the medium is still, uh, although we have now a number of practitioners who have come up with work, uh, I think we're still, in a sense, uh, in a kind of a childhood of the graphic novel. I mean, at this point, as you may have noticed from the pictures, I mean, the images we've shown, that each one, each new one that comes out, charts a kind of a new territory, creates a breakthrough somewhere, does something different. Uh, I think we haven't yet reached a point where we're get, getting so much of it, uh, or enough of it, that uh, we're able to look at different categories or different trends or different, you know, it's like each one is new compared to what went before. And so we are still at that point in, in my mind. Which kind of stories are better in a comic medium rather than a literary medium? To tell a story, like which should stories be drawn and which should be written? Is there a difference? Uh, there, I mean, there's no formula for that, obviously. Uh, it depends on the sensibility of the creator. Uh, it's not something that you objectively choose, but it's also something to do with innately the kind of storyteller you are or the creator is and uh, having said that I think the only 
uh, factor I feel uh, which is why it, what attracts me to comics uh, a lot although I write a lot also but I think the thing is that uh, um, uh, th that through images you can make kind of connections at simultaneously many different levels. Sometimes I find language is very, I mean textual language is linear. One sentence has to follow another, has to follow another and together they make sense. But in images you can say five things at the same time uh, in parallel and your reader may read point five or understand point number five first and point number one later or not understand point one at all in an image and it doesn't matter. Uh, I mean it's open to many different kinds of interpretations and combinations. So to me uh, graphic novels or visual literature or whatever you call it uh, is like uh, in language I would say it's closer not to storytelling but to poetry because I think poetry evokes that kind of uh, uh, parallels and the kind of metaphors and the kind of uh, connections at different levels uh, happening simultaneously. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I don't. Th I mean, it's you can't really go by a formula. It has to be what you want to tell and how you tell it. The same story can be told with text or with comics or in cinema, but each one is the treatment would be different. Uh, uh, we'll actually wind up with a question with with a, with a question actually, a which, which, is thrown to, which is thrown which is thrown to you. Is, is a James Joyce possible through the graphic novel? I mean, I mean, I think that was where what you were getting at in terms of is there something which is only so essentially literary that it cannot be done in a graphic form at all? I mean, I, I think yes, there is, you know. It's not as if the literary is now no longer valid or legitimate uh, no, as a of course not. <laughs> form of expression. Uh, the literary fiction that is, I mean, of course, you know, and, and I'm glad that you mentioned that poetry, uh, you know, I mean, in some sense it's closer to poetry and s simply you know, the, the use of metaphors, the many layering of language, you know, many references, yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's one gentleman but maybe, there. maybe there will be a James Joyce of the graphic novel. Yeah. There's one gentleman there who's been raising his hand from okay. the beginning. Uh, yeah, I, I think this question may have to be taken outside the forum because, uh, or do we have time for one last quick question, quick answer? All right, so yeah, so uh, we have to unfortunately wind up here, but uh, but Orjit is here, available for to, for any of you to ask questions to. Uh, thank you very much for being here on a hot afternoon, uh, being with us through the journey of uh, through images and through through too much talk probably. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much. Thank you.